When Ryan's when it's time to begin, it's on the rewind to rhyme with John Pollock and waiting the A team. That makes sense that these things we see in the ring every week on TV. It's rewind to rhyme for Monday night, download a Tuesday morning from the post wrestling site. It's rewind to rhyme for Monday night on USA now on the John and Wade take the mic. Welcome everybody to Rewind to Raw. It's John Pollock here alongside Wei Ting. Hi, Wei. What's up, John? Uh, I'm doing well. Did you have a enjoyable weekend? That's always my concern on a Monday. Yeah, usually. Yeah, it was a pretty good weekend. As yeah, uh, did some podcasting. Uh, yeah, it was good. How about you? Um, I had a good weekend. It was pretty enjoyable. I went out for a bunch. I watched a UFC card on Saturday. Yeah. And uh, I didn't have a pay-per-view to watch on Sunday, so that was wonderful. You Did you actually manage to have uh, no issues with your UFC? I I had no issues. I didn't have to deal with ESPN+, Plus, so I, I had an absolutely flawless experience on Saturday. Right, right. Well, there's a lot to get to, John, so let's not uh, waste any time with the... Let's the throw small the small talk, talk out the yeah. window. It's gone. Um we will plug uh, what is coming up this week, but obviously we will have extensive Royal Rumble coverage uh, on Sunday night. We'll be live here for our Double Double Ice Cap and Espresso patrons. We're also going to be dropping a bonus show for Cafe members on Saturday with a quick run through of the new beginning in Nagoya card that's going down on Saturday with uh, Shingo Takagi and Hiroshi Tanahashi headlining that show. Uh, but lots of great stuff this week. The Royal Rumble pool is open until Sunday at 3 o'clock Eastern Time and Tuesday. We've got the Rocky Five review. Boom, boom, boom. Those are some of the big, the big things among many. Not to, not to downplay the fact that Way is in training for the Up Next Rumble on Thursday. Yeah, that's the big one. Up Next Rumble on Thursday, which is on uh, the BDE's Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash upnextpodcast. I'm ready for it. Well, the WWE is ready to jump into the world of NBCU and the Peacock streaming network way this was a massive story coming out on monday that the peacock network has obtained the exclusive u.s streaming rights for the wwe network this will uh, begin march the 18th with u.s subscribers migrating over to the peacock premium service which is 4.99 a month that comes with ads so if you want to just make that that flip you will still get all of the wwe network content at half the price you're paying for the current WWE Network, or you can upgrade to the uh, Peacock Premium Plus, which is their $9.99 tier that comes without ads. This is going to include all of the pay-per-views, beginning with Fastlane on March 21st. Of course, it will include WrestleMania as well, and they are going to start the rollout of 17,000 hours of content that they will be adding to the Peacock service. Uh, we can go into more details, but as an overall um, takeaway way, what did you think about this move? Not one that uh, you know we have been talking about for the last year, the idea of the WWE licensing their premium events off the network. This is taking the entire thing in the US and moving it to an outside player. Yeah, I think it's a variation on on that idea. You know, ultimately, it's it's the pay per views that I feel like are the most valuable of this entire thing. But having that library is just kind of a nice bonus. Um, but you know, I heard the news, and I think it made a whole lot of sense for all parties involved. To me, it was like one of those announcements where I it was hard for me to see a downside for anybody involved, including the audience members who you know um, pay less to get what they want to see. This, this is definitely the fan friendlier option of what the WWE was debating. Like the like and we had talked about like the the WWE network in uh, really worldwide. It peaked in 2018 with the WrestleMania the first year with Ronda Rousey. That was the highest the WWE network had hit. And I think it was a realization they were not going to hit these lofty expectations at any time of three to four million subscribers, which were numbers thrown out, um, you know, th during the launch and they would continue to have those, those aspirational goals. So once you, you have realized that, I think they're looking at, this is still premium content. I think when the ESPN plus deal with the UFC went down, they realized we, we have significant, uh, leverage here with, with the content. And are we in this long game with the WWE network? Uh, they were at one point, but the world has changed. And I think they realized there's, 
enormous revenue to be made for these shows being licensed versus keeping them in house. And uh, the reported figures um, that Sports Business Journal and the Wall Street Journal reported, uh, it's a five year deal with the Peacock Network worth over a billion dollars over those five years. So that's an average annual value of over 200 million per year. So in essence, they have created uh, another giant uh, guaranteed revenue stream for them for at least the next five years. Uh, while at the same time, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see if this migration process goes seamlessly. I would think anybody that is getting the network uh, will want to be on this on this new service, and especially with the caveat that you can have this WWE network at half the price you're paying now. Or if you stick with the same price, or even if you just pay half the price and watch ads. But either way, you are getting something more. You're getting the entire whatever Peacock library. You're getting Peacock's library. It's, it's like this is a very fan-friendly option of the available ones out there. This is not trying to put WrestleMania back as a pay-per-view which I, I would say if you were going to try that, you would probably want to try it in conjunction with, with a new deal. But they are not doing that. So I it's think actually, that's... It's actually the opposite. They're making WrestleMania $5 or in many cases free. So they're actually, if, you're, if you're a subscriber to Comcast or Cox in the US, it's like this comes with it. So yeah, for some, they will get it for free. Like it's it's a very good deal there. I would say the only... I'm curious about this migration process. Is it simply something where it's boom, you're logged in. You don't have to sign up for anything. There's no multiple step process because I would think that of those 1.1 million US, U.S. subscribers, some of them are probably idle accounts that have just, you know, you've you've let it just stay there on your bill. It's there. You're not getting your maximum use out of it. And if you have to go through the whole process of signing up for a separate place, Maybe you're not all that enticed to do it, but this would be the time of year to do it. This would be WrestleMania is the one show a year you are watching, but I would say it would be a pretty high percentage, I would imagine, of those 1.1 million that are going to jump on this at either tier. And I I think a a number of them will do the higher price tier without ads. I think so, too. You know, um, you know, you hear about the news and I think it's a reminder at how much the landscape might might have changed in the time that WWE started this WWE network and where we are now. Um, I think at the time it was like a perfectly sound decision to like bring everything in house and to create your own platform to like broadcast your own stuff. But in, in 2021, like there's a huge, huge race now between all these majors like Disney, like Comcast, like Amazon trying to create their own platforms and so WWE with their service just kind of finds himself as like pretty small fish in a pretty big pond. And it's like, you know, these giants are like trying to survive themselves in these streaming wars, trying to grab a slice of that pie before it's too late. And, the, you know, the, the name of this game is like to gobble up as many of your properties as you can, suffer your losses, maybe overpay for some properties so you don't lose to a Disney or to an Amazon or to a, a, a Netflix in the future. But um, I think it 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 makes a lot of sense for all the parties involved. Um, Peacock certainly, like if they want to catch up to the competition, they need a whole lot more on their plate. They need to be making big moves right now. Live sports seems to be you know something that is valuable to really anybody. Um, but it's you know WWE like for maybe all the lack of um, you know uh, lack of reaching the the their projections for the network. I mean because they are a content producer, not just a streaming platform they are always going to be in a great position because they can always sell their stuff to somebody else. And in the case of this being sports and live content, they're always going to be very attractive. So they, they, you know, they've really just kind of pivoted their plans and continue to do really well. I want to read this one quote. This is from uh, Rick Cordella, who's the chief revenue officer at Peacock. He spoke to uh, the rap today and they were asked like, what, what is the benefit to Peacock of this deal? And he was stating that our overall goal and why I think NBCU decided to move forward with this deal is that we believe we can expand the accessibility of this content, uh, that we can through NBCU marketing, through the outlets that we have, all the various media outlets, through the print point reduction, 
uh, the addition of content, we can grow this audience significantly that currently watches it. And that will have downstream impact to the rest of WWE and those TV ratings, hopefully that you see on linear television as well as to Peacock. There's a halo effect to those users coming in for WrestleMania, but then sticking around and watching The Office, watching Yellowstone, watching some of the great content we have. Okay, and then he's uh, putting over uh, those uh, notes. There was also um, the same individual spoke to uh, John Orand at Sports Business Journal. And, you know, their belief is that what Peacock has experienced since it launched last July is that live sports, which he notes uh, U.S. Open Golf, the EPL, they've had uh, an NFL wildcard game. When they've been able to bring these these live sports events in, they have found that the viewership sticks around and checks out other programming. And one of their advantages is that they are a streaming service that is ad supported as opposed to others that are not ad supported. Now the history of pro wrestling, and this has been something that has followed raw throughout its entire uh, legacy is that people will jump networks and follow raw, but it hasn't always been um, a case where this large audience on a Monday night is going to transfer over and stick around for other programming on the network. One of the best examples was the ultimate fighter, but there were plenty where the wrestling fans were there for the wrestling and Peacock, I think is very much hopeful that these fans will become, you know, viewers of other NBC properties. But in that first quote that I just read, like the fact that this is NBC universal, it tells me like this, this is a play by NBC universal, not just to, lift up their Peacock service, but it's also to get more eyes on the WWE product. Like they are going on to a streaming service that is in over 26 million homes as we speak. So you have the ability to reach a lot of people. And I think they're looking at this as not just a simple black and white. We are looking for subscribers on our network, but they are looking at getting audiences to watch one of their key properties on the USA network and to have to, to grow that audience as well. So I think it's a multifaceted one of what their their goals are. And when you look at the, the big amount that they're spending, like it's, it's a huge amount that for all of these big deals, the look is like at the end of this deal, will that look like a steal or will it look like they overpaid? Like today you can look at it and say, that's a gigantic figure. But by the end of this, uh, it, it may not look like that. It's it will depend on how this performs. It's it's a gamble on Peacock's part. It's a gamble on WWE's part because if this doesn't perform at the end of five years, um, you know, you would have to reassess what your your pay per view strategy is. But for the present and for the next five years, this is a it's a tremendous uh, added revenue stream for WWE. Yeah, it largely depends, I think, on you know how Peacock ultimately does, how successful they are uh, amongst the rest of the competition for for us to be able to determine. Um, it's 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 going to be an interesting five years because um, I feel like even at the end of the five five years, WWE will be in a really good position because I don't see live sports. Um, I don't see the demand for live sports going away anytime soon. I. I think, you know, maybe this arms race between all these networks um, trying to start up their uh, streaming platforms, paying a whole lot for uh, a lot of these properties. I wonder if that'll calm down. But I think regardless, at the end of the five years, if the WWE, you know, barring any sort of like catastrophic, like collapse of its business, which I don't see ever happening, certainly not. Not with these deals. Not with. Yeah, they're bullet. Just with with Raw, Fox and this, uh, this is going to be like north of like. $670 $670 million wrapped up in like the Fox deal, the raw deal, and now this, this streaming service. And that's, you know, and that, you know, that's gigantic. Like that's guaranteed without looking at any other income. Yeah. I mean, I feel like they'll be able to command this price um, even in that time. And so I, I feel like it'll kind of ultimately work out for Comcast, but you know, if this, if this whole Peacock thing collapses, then, Maybe the you know they can afford it. They can afford the gamble. Is 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 the difference though? They're not just some small company. They can, you know, take a big risk like this. And if it doesn't pan out, the company still has so many other properties. Um, but, you know, what are some other questions you have coming out of this whole thing? Well, I mean, some of my takeaways, like the the first one is that this was Nick Khan's first massive move since coming in as as the company's president, and he was the 
front facing person on all the media releases today. Like this was his stamp over all this. And I think this was an enormous sign of what an incredible hiring Nick Khan was. I think this would give you great confidence going into all future television negotiations that this guy is at the helm. And I, I would have all the confidence in the world of Nick Khan's ability to land as profitable a deal as WWE could could wish for. And, and th- this would be that, that first major deal. Like this was very much attached to Nick Khan's name in, in all of the all of the articles today, the press releases, like it was his voice representing WWE. You know, I'm really curious to know, certainly like I feel the game is to try to acquire as many people to subscribe to something like this right now. And maybe that means, you know, giving getting them in the door for $5, getting them in the door for free, even in some cases. But inevitably, anytime you have one of these things, the price will go up. So when will that be? Um, I am also curious, like, is yeah, this the, the Peacock executive? He, I mean, even said that, like, we're not planning this, but we can never say that we won't re- uh, visit that like that. That could very well be a case where, you know, there will be a price increase at, at, at some point, like four ninety nine for a streaming service is, you know, on the lower side. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, this is not certainly not without risk to WWE, in my opinion. I, I mean, the pros uh, far outweigh the cons, no pun intended there, but um. It, it, this, does this mean like they are going to abandon, you know, ever coming back to doing an in-house network? Because personally, I don't really see them being able to at this point. You've gone to the point now where you are, you know, conditioning your audience to not pay $10 for it. You're asking them to pay $5 for it. And that to me is a model that WWE can't sustain because they can't acquire the type of advertising uh, partners that Comcast would be able to. So you know, at the end of these five years, let's say like the streaming wars are somehow collapsed. There's nobody else to go to. It's kind of difficult for me to think about WWE going backwards and rebuilding this network as we still see it today. What do you think? Well, it's still going to exist for all of the international markets. And my God, if I was asked that question a hundred times today of like what this means for those outside the US, it means nothing. The network is still the same outside of the US. Nothing yet. I mean, like you would you would assume that they might be looking for these sort of deals for all their other markets as well. Oh, oh, 100 percent. I think that this would be like when, you know, it's it's not all that different. Like in in Canada, like WWE is not the distributor of the network. Rogers is in India. It's now Sony that is distributing the network. So I do feel this is going to be the model is like when the, the WWE deal with Rogers comes up in 2024. I think this is what they're going to be looking for is like an increase in in rights for like Rogers has the whole package. They have Raw, they have SmackDown, they have NXT, and they have the distribution rights for the network. I think they're going to be looking for those models uh, internationally. But at least in the interim, like you are subscribing to the network outside of the US, that is how it's going to work for you. Now, I do know a lot of Canadians have brought up the fact that those without cable, like there is not a system in place. I can't say this for all providers, but the main ones, you can if you are without cable, you cannot sign up for the WWE network or even sign up for like a Rogers window without having a cable subscription and that's how uh, people have been going about getting it is through a VPN and then you sign up for the network directly and I guess the concern with this changeover that that may prove to be more difficult with Peacock yeah, I'm one of those people. I subscribe through a PayPal account um, for the U.S. version of the account. So I I guess I'll have to call my parents to, I don't know, get the network on, the, on their devices now. It, it's a bit of a hassle, but I, I feel like that's a probably relatively small, you know, audience of, of hardcores that will probably figure out other ways to be able to it's get It's a this. small number, but it is one where, um, like, I, I would imagine it's a small enough number that Rogers is not incentivized to put that kind of in- infrastructure in place. They mm-hmm. want you to be getting their cable service. But nonetheless, it's uh, like, I, I I don't know how that would necessarily work. But like, what is preventing you from using your VPN service to sign up for Peacock? Yeah, well, I, I've never tried it. I know some sites probably just uh, the thing is, you don't need a VPN and you need a VPN, I believe, to at least maybe I don't even think you need a VPN to sign up for the network the way that, you know, some Canadians do. You just simply need like a a PayPal account. 
and then you can actually there's there's a way to do it i forget but the problem is after the fact you don't need a vpn in order to access wwe network i can access it on my phone i can stream it cast it whatever but peacock i won't be able to do that unless i always have a vpn on which i do right. not so that would be a difference my other question is you know with this being on on the premium tier that has ads included what does that mean for a pay-per-view such as a wrestlemania um, how are ads going to be slotted in there for the ad tier? I don't know. We might be subjected to ads. I, d- I don't know if like they're like WWE. We haven't seen a whole lot of like, like geo filtering or, or geo blocking. And I don't know how you d- we would, would possibly go about doing that from a logistical standpoint for a live broadcast. See, I, cause I, th- I wonder like, cause you're not only going to have to have an ad version of this, of this live show, you're going to have an ad free version as well. So are we going to maybe see something like what AEW does with, uh, AEW plus and AEW, or you just throw the commercial brick for one audience and stay for the premium users? Cause that would greatly affect the flow of these matches on these pay-per-views. Oh well, yeah. And it's like, it becomes difficult. Like if, uh. Like if you're inserting like actual commercial breaks, like that would be, I don't know if you would be going to that extent. I don't know if it'd be that uh, intrusive, like actually taking a break during a pay-per-view for, you know, a, a two minute commercial right, uh, break. Um, but then that becomes a question of like, if you're an international distributor, it's like, if I'm a Rogers, then we're, we're not getting any cut of this advertising revenue, but we are uh, subjecting that to our, our customer base. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just thinking like, what is the ad experience like for the $5 tier when you're watching a pay-per-view? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, obviously there has to be, um, I'm sure it's a much easier answer because if you're on the 999 tier, you're not getting the ads. So mm-hmm. I would think that that, that would be the worldwide, like, yeah, I would imagine like it's, it's actually probably a fairly simple explanation that it's, not going to be like baked into the actual programming that it's something that would be specific to your device that you're watching like that 499 tier on, on Peacock. Well, like a pop-up or something like that. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'll be curious, like fast lane to like how much advertising is um, part of that show, because you would imagine it would be there right from the get go. And we'll get a sense of how ad heavy it is. Uh, and I would say, even if you're a new subscriber or an existing subscriber, if you're going to try out the 499 tier, and if it's not that uh, obtrusive, then or intrusive, then you might just be happy to pay half. It's like you would have to be really inundated with ads, I think, to make that jump up to 999 versus paying half. Well, it's for that reason that I think you will be. It, it will be a bit more of an obtrusive experience because if you're only going to sit through two ads when you load up the pay per view and you get to enjoy the rest of the show ad free, I'm not going to have much incentive to upgrade. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be very much like a, like, like where you get like on YouTube, where it just, you hit a certain time mark and then the ad starts and that will be kind of how they're worked into it. I don't know. It just um, changes things when it's live content versus the on-demand content that they, that could pick up after a, a spot that you pause in. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, that'll be an interesting question. The other one, and this is a larger story that we're not going to know the answer to, but Come 2024, when the deal is up for Raw and the deal is up for SmackDown and Comcast now is the distributor of the WWE Network and they're sitting down to negotiate with Nick Khan about a renewal, I cannot imagine that the the idea of what would the company all in be and Comcast having that discussion. Like if this proves to be a fruitful relationship over the next few years, do you want to go out and spend... Uh, another billion dollars spread out over five, six more years for raw versus going in for multiple billions and trying to buy the company outright. Big topic of conversation, no doubt. Um, yeah. Uh, it, if it's- like, I think you have to look at that as at least a possibility of what Comcast is looking at because they are going to have all the pieces with the exception of SmackDown on Fox and, and that will be interesting too of how aggressive they can promote this on on Fox. Like they mm-hmm. have been there is no issue of promoting uh things coming up on Raw and mentioning the USA network and vice versa for Raw to SmackDown, uh but does, you know, like the next uh the next 2 3 months as you're going into WrestleMania, like you want to be hammering people over the head and if there are anybody with more uh 
more of a skill of taking said hammer and drilling you over the head. It is WWE in terms of promotion. Yeah, it's going to be like, I, I have to imagine. I don't know if Fox will be too happy, like, you know, to have their go home shows essentially direct people to a rival's streaming platform every month. Um, but you know, I, I suppose these are the terms of this very kind of weird, um, uh, system that pro wrestling has kind of created. Um, but we're going to see uh, the effects of a lot of those things. Do you think this deal has any effect at all on perhaps the greater wrestling landscape? And I should say that, you know, this is something that's really kind of making everybody realize again, that WWE for all the comparisons we might make to their competitors. They are playing a game at a far higher level than anybody else, including AEW or, you know, anybody else. But do you think any there's any trickle down effect to the rest of the wrestling landscape? To, to AEW, yes. I think that AEW, it's inevitable that they uh, get a streaming deal. I mean, they I mean, Warner Media has like, the, you know, they have HBO Max. They have their kind of in-house uh, streaming home. Uh, but AEW, to me, that. That is a big deal for them, and I, I'm not expecting them to get go out and get a deal that's worth a uh, billion dollars over five years, but a fraction of it, yes. I think that you can look at AEW, and they are, to me, if I was looking at this deal from a, a TNT perspective, I'm certainly looking at it that look at what the ceiling is, and for many players out there that could not, this is way too rich for most people's blood to be in this business with WWE, AEW is a smaller audience, but it's one that has shown growth and you could get for a a fraction of the amount. Like AEW has a TV deal of 175 million over four years. That is, that is less than what Raw or SmackDown make annually. So I think that certainly we could be looking at AEW uh, landing a streaming deal, um, not at this level, but a, a fraction of it, which would be significantly, um, upgrading AEW's lot to be able to land such a deal where they ha- have that guaranteed revenue. Certainly, certainly. I mean, ultimately, I think, you know, AEW will, will probably, like all, like WWE maintain a TV presence, but, you know, it, would, it wouldn't necessarily preclude them from increasing their pay-per-views to several more a year, perhaps, and then maybe selling that off to a streaming platform, for instance. It's it's again, it's a very different ball game. Like we're talking about WWE, which has like years, decades of like name value attached to it that I think in itself is worth something to be built next to a peacock. AEW does not have that, but um, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, it this is not good news for them as well. In terms of uh, the WrestleMania option and going this way, are you surprised by that? Do you think it is? I, I think it's almost done at this point. The idea of you being being able to take WrestleMania back to being a pay per view property. Uh, do you think that could have been done, or would that have been too much friction for your subscriber base that you're throwing this big change on them and telling them that you have to pay for WrestleMania this year? I think it largely depends on the um, perhaps you know um, game plan of the streaming platform that they were to sign with. If they signed with ESPN, I think you know it would have been perfectly you know fitting of them doing the same thing that UFC that they're doing with UFC. Uh, it doesn't seem like Comcast and Peacock are looking to do pay per views on top of what they're already doing. It seems like they're kind of going all in on this five dollar ad supported tier and then the ten dollar ad free tier. So it. You know, I, I I don't know if that would have been too much of a of a choice for the WWE, I suppose. No, I mean, that that would have been, you know, ultimately a, a peacock decision. But I think that, you know, certainly I think if you could go back, I still believe that WrestleMania would have been the one show you would have tried to maintain as as a pay-per-view property, even if it led to the WWE Network. Uh, not getting to the heights that it did. I mean, you, you can you can look back in hindsight at that. I think it's pretty difficult at this time to try and put the genie back in the bottle with uh, going back to pay-per-view. I think that would be very difficult. And I think Peacock's perspective is they just want as many people in the door as seamlessly as possible without any hurdles in the way, such as a, a big uh, price barrier for a two-day WrestleMania event. I think they just... I think they look at WrestleMania that it's the most attractive show on the calendar, and this is going to get the most people in at a reduced rate for for many people if they go for the the smaller rate. So, um, what do you think that it means for NXT? 
I think that will be very interesting. Um, you know, all the reports are that their deal is up in October. And I would say that NXT is very safe in that it will be somewhere. The question is where. I don't know. It, like, if you are looking at a longer term commitment with the NHL, I think that drastically reduces the chances of NXT staying on Wednesday nights. But whether that's moving them to another night of the week, um, I, I think a lot of that depends on, on how successful this this move to Peacock is. If they're doing um, if they're doing tremendously well and they're happy with the numbers, whatever they're forecasting for year one, then I mean NXT is something where maybe it's just we move it to another night. Maybe they find a way to keep it on, on Wednesdays. If numbers are not so great, maybe they look at that as their ace up their sleeve that moving NXT to Peacock is something that will attract people to move over and sign up for the service. And I would say for NXT, what it would gain is, like, I think ultimately there's going to be interest in NXT when their deal comes up. It's just a question of where it lands, and this has to be a candidate. Yeah, I I personally, um, I, I, I don't know if, you know, I see it landing in this network afterwards, uh, after the deal is done. I just think at this point, they made such a great push for this being a TV property. I feel like they will be able to garner more money as a for NXT as a TV property than just to be have it absorbed as part of this Peacock thing. Um, but yeah, we'll see come October. Any other thoughts just uh, overall on just the news or questions you have? That this will probably dominate the earnings call next Thursday. I would think that this is going to be the the key uh, stuff, and not to be lost in all this is that they announced today that they're expecting uh, record re- record business uh, to report next week for 2020. Yeah, not really in terms of questions. I'm sure um, you know many things will just kind of play itself out over the months and years ahead. But um, are you interested at all in maybe taking some questions from the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, uh, maybe we'll just kind of take a few questions right now, everybody. For people in the Zoom chat room, uh, just raise your hand. We'll, we'll, we won't maybe you know spend uh, so long on calls, but if you do have any sort of questions and you want to talk about this topic, it's a big news story. So just raise your hand in the Zoom chat room, and I will get to you. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, John, uh, any other things to maybe discuss in news? Um. A few things, if you want to go over to the website, uh, we learned tonight that Roderick McMahon, the brother of Vince McMahon, passed away last Wednesday. Uh, there was uh, an obit online um, that he passed away. They uh, didn't state how, but um, he was a resident of Willis, Texas. I'm just reading this off the site. He was also a member of the U.S. Air Force. It was in the Air Force that he met his future wife, Jamis Gagan McMahon. And they founded North American Metals Incorporated uh, and were married for 53 years. And I mean, this was not a name you heard often, but when they did the the Vince McMahon uh, death back in 2007, where he exploded in the limo, if you remember the next week, they were going to do the funeral, which ultimately got canceled because that's when the Benoit story broke. But they were going to do a funeral on Raw and Rod McMahon was going to appear at the funeral in his lone on-screen appearance in WWE, but it never happened, so he never appeared. But that was the idea of a special cameo for Vince McMahon's funeral. And he's not made any appearance, as far as we know. He's he's never appeared on on, on television. So, wow. um, yeah. So we send our our condolences over that. Um, as well, we have uh, AEW Revolution. Um, this was reported by the Wrestling Observer over the weekend. It will take place Sunday, March the 7th. What do you think about a Sunday AEW pay-per-view? This will be the night after UFC 259, which is uh, three title fights, including Israel Adesanya going up in weight to challenge uh, Jan Blachowicz for the light heavyweight title. So they will run a Sunday night pay-per-view for the first time. I mean, for a wrestling fan, it doesn't really make all that big of a difference. Uh, is this because of the Jake Paul thing? Um, I, is the, I, I don't think that's officially been announced. Um, I guess that's no, a rumor okay. date for, for the six, but I, I would say just the idea of like, I don't think it's going to be a giant UFC, uh, but it'll be something that you wouldn't want to run the same night as, um, yeah. So I, I don't know if that went into the thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I don't think it'll make a difference for their audience. They've really tested their audience's patience with like following, following them around this past summer. And we've seen, you know, this is a crowd that will follow them no matter what. 
anywhere. So I don't think it'll make a, a change at all. And uh, yeah, if that's it, if that's it for the news, nobody really has any questions. So I guess we really answered it all. And if you want a bit more information about it all, uh, John did a great chat with Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics. That's up on the free feed right now from earlier this afternoon. You can go and listen to that. Um, and one other thing, the SmackDown number from Friday, they did a great number uh, by their standards, 2,383,000 viewers. So if you throw out the Christmas episode that followed the NFL, this was their best viewership since April the 3rd, which was the go-home show for WrestleMania. Uh, they were up 5% in viewers this week, uh, although down 7% in the demo. They still did a 0.63, so they were second for the night um, uh, among programming. Uh, but that, to me, like SmackDown has been doing... Uh, very well of late, and I attribute that to the main event program. And I, I think that the tease of Heyman and Paul and Adam Pierce was uh, probably very helpful. Like that style of promoting within the body of a show uh, uh, of a weird match that tends to work. And I think that overall, it's the the Reigns program and those uh, characters associated with Reigns. It's clicking for for SmackDown. More Adam Pierce then. Adam Pierce. I mean, look at that. Um, a proven draw in 2021. So there you go. That's all of your news uh, to get to. And I guess we'll move on over to Raw, which had its own news uh, coming out of it. Uh, we'll get to all of that. But what feels like 10 hours ago, Drew McIntyre came out to start the show. And he thanked all the fans for their well wishes and said that he felt fatigue and he lost his sense of smell. But he was training by day four with COVID and he's a hundred percent now and he's going to be a hundred percent on Sunday. And he is going to dedicate this match to everyone out there with the virus together. We will beat it. Um, well, Dude, this guy I, can't well, lose. This guy cannot lose. This was as much <laughs> of a baby face swearing to God that he was going to win. He is dedicating it to every COVID patient out there. I, you know, I'm sure it'll be a great moral boost um, if he wins. I uh, may, might be overstating perhaps the effects of a, of a championship victory over Goldberg. But, uh, you know, it, it was I thought it was handled well. Like they could have not mentioned Drew's, um, you know, belt with COVID at all. But instead, they chose to kind of lean into it, had Drew convey a sense of seriousness about the disease. And then even, you know, providing a nice little tribute for as a baby face for the for the victims. I, th I thought it was a nice message and it goes kind of against like for, for a company that seems so averse to even say the word COVID uh, to have their big baby face champion talk about uh, being hit with the symptoms and, and such like it's like it sounds silly to anyone that doesn't follow this. But like, like to me that that was more than I expected uh, because really it was uh, beyond Drew's acknowledgement like last week it was they were like avoiding even saying why Drew wasn't even here last week. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there. I don't know how much of a space they. It's not like that. I, I expect them to mention it every instance of like you know mentioning Drew McIntyre. But I think when their opportunity arises, and especially when the opportunity arises to, to say something important, like guys, take this stuff seriously, like that. That I think was is worthwhile. So he cuts a promo on Goldberg. He's not taking him lightly, <laughs> and that th this was the best subtle jab. I've been watching him since I was a teenager and Bill came up in a system that wasn't designed to succeed. He beat Hogan for the title. Then he beat the rock and then he disappeared for years, which was quite the, quite the time capsule of Bill Goldberg's career. That's, um, yeah. Was, is he wrong? I mean, didn't make, I, th I think there was a little more in there. Oh, I, I mean, guess Brock and all that stuff. Yeah, you're right. He said, the last thing to go for a fighter is his power. And Goldberg returned as an animal, and he's created a new streak because every time he has challenged a champion, he has won that title. Well, that streak ends on Sunday. Uh, kudos to the person that found like a, a, compelling, uh, a compelling piece of storyline continuity here to give you like a backstory for this Sunday, for something for Drew to overcome. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was well done. Um, you know, nice and simple and to the point. Then the Miz and John Morrison interrupted. They said that this is going to be like King Kong and Godzilla on Sunday, a hellacious fight, and the consequences are that either man could get injured, and that's when the winner will be a sitting duck for the Miz to cash in his briefcase. So then Goldberg comes out. He has a stare down with Drew, but then they look at the geeks, and 
Goldberg spears the Miz. Claymore's hit the Morrison. Back to our face-off. And Drew hoists up the title before tossing the briefcase away. I thought a really good segment with these two. I thought so, too. I thought the spear looked good. The Claymore looked good. And I like Goldberg's promo. I mean, it should have been what he said. Because <laughs> he said nothing? <laughs> well, he said, you, me, Sunday, you're next. Okay, that was, that was all you needed for this. It's really I, all, I, it's really all this he should have said the last time. This was, to me, like, one, one of the bigger problems is when you have a big gap between pay-per-views and... You have to go through every idea. We got to do the contract signing, the attacks, the parking lot brawls, awful comedy. In this, you had two appearances for Goldberg. One of them was kind of squandered. You were left with the novelty of Goldberg wrestling Drew, and it was not a great segment. And then you had one other appearance, and this was all you needed. And I thought this was this was handled very well. I had no complaints about this segment. Agreed. So that's it. What'd you think about Raw tonight? I thought this was a thumbs up show. <laughs> if that was it, if that was Raw, yeah. Charlie is with Charlotte. She's got a big week ahead. Uh, she's got her first singles match with Shayna Baszler coming up, and she can bring her invisible crown. She's going to defend her tag titles and enter the Rumble this weekend. So it is Charlotte and Asuka, the friends that don't talk to each other, against Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler, the partners that hate each other. And then Charlotte will enter the Rumble the same night. Yes. Yes. She calls herself Miss WrestleMania. And then Charlie asks about her dad. And Charlotte says, I've seen my dad in some dark places. This might be the darkest. Hmm. This. This wow. affair with Lacey Evans may be the darkest Rick has ever been in. Hmm. This man was literally on his deathbed. I think he's had some worse experiences than what he's currently going through with Lacey Evans. And she says, it's different when you're carrying the weight of the last name Flair. So she came out for this match with Shayna Baszler and Flair sent Nia into the desk. And then from behind, Shayna goes for the Kirafuda clutch, but it stopped. And Charlotte goes for this running boot that they should have just cut away because this came nowhere close. She goes for the figure eight setup, but Nia comes into the ring with a leg drop in 55 seconds, and our dream match ends with a nightmare. And then Mandy and Dana Brooke are out to help. Flair joins in. Lacey shows up. You wouldn't believe what happened. We go to break and come back, and we've got a six-woman tag. Impromptu. Seemed like there was a whole lot of stretching again going on this week with, you know, people appearing in multiple segments. So, yeah. Well, we'll get to this. Uh, so the beginning of this match, uh, Evans escapes from Brooke and tags Baszler, who gets in with Flair. Uh, Baszler's attacking her with leg kicks. Rose and Brooke do a pair of double cartwheels, uh, but didn't quite have their timing here as they went for their almost simultaneous drop kicks to Shayna. Baszler and Flair then go to the floor, and then they're going around the ring. Flair rolls into the ring, followed by Shayna, but the referee calls for the bell, and... Shayna Baszler was legitimately counted out here, and uh, Mike Johnson had an update on this, that, th yes, this was a legit count out, and then they had to imp imp uh, do an impromptu deal here with Pierce to restart the match. It was the same thing that happened with New Day, and, um, what is it, Hurt Business? One of those. That's right. Uh, yeah, New Day and Hurt Business. Um I they just totally fucked that up. I mean, it's super awkward, and I don't know if you really blame Shayna or Charlotte here, or the both of them for taking their time. Um, I also wondered if there, there might have been. I mean, she wrestled afterwards, so it clearly wasn't sort of an injury or anything like that. But man, I was not upset at all that this match ended because it wasn't doing much for me. No, what I hated was this. I got more pissed off at the sloppy restart. Oh, dude, there there was plenty here. So. I mean, I'll give them some, like, leeway because this was obviously impromptu and they just kind of had to have Pierce out there. They restart the match. It's just, it's totally silly. Like, it was a count-out finish. This is the problem I have, okay? They tell the referees to make sure, that, you know, if, if, if their shoulders are on the mat, you count to three, even if it's not supposed to be the finish. If they're out and they're counted out, you make sure you count the count out. They have so much respect for the authenticity of these wrestling rules that they're willing to scrap their storylines in order to end a segment early by doing something like this. Why can't you show the same respect for the authenticity of matchmaking if this was a real-life situation? 
in no, no reality would, you, would these matches simply restart like this, you know, because of a heel complaining and the, you know, Adam Pierce coming out. Like, I would personally make the argument that having Pierce come out and rebooking this match on the fly is a hundred times worse than having the ref simply slow count the count out and avoiding the entire mess. So I know, like, there's some sort of like thing they have of a, of a, like really respecting the, the rules, but if they're going to go ahead and just like do something as fake as this afterwards, anyway, you might as well not respect these rules and have the referees simply, you know, accommodate the story that's supposed to occur. Cause how many people would really notice? Well, you know what? Maybe they're going to sign red shoes and he'll come over and dude, this guy will let the count ride. He he's uh, it's 365 days a year. He's in the playoffs. I'd rather that than like a weird, awkward restart like this in the show. Like well, it's it's weird in that this year I feel like they already they've already had several of these instances that are, are is just like really sloppy. Well, that was the theme as we continued because Dana Brooke goes for this handspring off the ropes, and while she's upside down, she catches Naya in a head scissors, and then was supposed to send Naya into the corner. Naya goes into this corner with the urgency of me jogging out to grab the newspaper. She totally misses the corner. This just looked horrendous. They have the heat on Dana, who gets her uh, arm stomped. And then Jax is in, seated splash. Uh, then everyone's getting in. Flair spears Baszler. Jax takes out Charlotte, and then Lacey Evans yanks Charlotte to the floor, and Flair chases her away. Jax runs into the corner, hits her shoulder, Dana hits the swinging neckbreaker, only gets a two count, and then Nia lifts up Dana and gave her the most frightening choke slam. And Dana Brooke is hit with a leg drop in 4.52. I was frightened watching this for Dana Brooke. Her head just bounced off the mat. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hope she's okay from the slam. I mean, they definitely, you know, replayed the, the, uh, replays for, for all their effect, but, um, you know who my worst in wrestler, this, you know who my worst female wrestler this year was? Well, making us a, a strong argument for, uh, a 2021 campaign like this, this was just, I don't know. You just shake your head at this, uh, for what it was worth. Uh, Mike Johnson had that update about this match, about the, the restart and did note that, he was told that Dana was uh, 100% okay after the rough bump from the Nia Jax chokeslam. So uh, hopefully Dana was fine from this. But they, it, it, they showed the replays of this too. It was like, man, it was just just terrible. Yeah, I mean, I at this point, like, what what can you do? Like, what what more can be said? You know, like, I feel like there have been plenty of examples of of you know this this performer looking re- reckless, but you know not being in the ring, I suppose it's and she uh, she had a very bad uh, match here beyond just the choke slam. Hmm. So th- this is not good. Uh, Mustafa Ali cut a promo on Kofi Kingston. He says the greatest moment of Kofi's life occurred because it was the worst moment of his, and they're continuing that. WWE backstage is back on Saturday night. Renee Paquette. Page and Booker T, no CM Punk on this show, uh, but it will be airing Saturday night at 8 on FS1, and they're going to reveal the 30th entrant in the Men's Rumble and the first two entrants in the Women's Rumble. Mm Mm-hmm. That's a bit of a hook. Did they mess up our pool? Oh. Uh, I think they might I'm pretty sure we did not put 30th entrants, because I think we learned from that, but the women's, the first two entrants, I don't know, we might have... They might have got us there, so that might be a free point for everybody. I, you know, I I haven't filled my brackets yet, but uh, postwrestling.com slash rumble if you want to get yours in. You okay. might next year it's going to be you're going to be picking entrant number sixteen and the 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 last four entrants uh, going backwards. Well, maybe they'll announce that too. <laughs> backstage, backstage. <laughs> oh, Xavier Woods and Slapjack. I love this. As Retribution is coming out, Tom Phillips has to do the ad read for Popeyes. <laughs> Got to watch uh, Mace and T-Bar as Tom Phillips is uh, telling us about the brioche bun that you can now get at Popeyes. I like Popeyes. You know, I've never gone to Popeyes in my life. 
Wow. What am I missing out on? Amazing fried chicken. Are you a fried I, chicken guy? I love oh. fried chicken. I, What's I look your fried at Popeye's. Chicken of choice? Oh, man. Um, well, over the last year, nowhere. Um, there was this barbecue place on. Oh, I, the name's escaping me right now. There's a place on the East End that is uh, fantastic. Okay. Well, what about a chain? Like, how many chains are there that offer fried chicken? It's KFC. Real, really? There's Popeyes. Churches. Not we a, have we have one. Yeah, those are. I know. Not n- not great. I K- KFC was was fine for a time, but I I got food poisoning twice at KFC, and it was that that was it for me. I I I was done with KFC in the year 2000. I, I haven't you, added you in told 20 story. years. Yeah, well, maybe you should well, try Popeyes. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> uh, what do we have here? Uh, Xavier Woods got in a bunch of offense here. He hit the honor roll. Ollie then sends T-Bar over to distract Woods. Uh, Woods takes a look at him, rolls away, and then catches Slapjack with the Shining Wizard. And Woods pins Slapjack. He did what Ricochet could not. He He pinned one of these fools. And then T-Bar attacks Woods on the floor. Mace and T-Bar then give him uh, the old high times by Chronic. And he's laid out. Ollie has a chair, and he's about to use it, but instead he sits down to talk to Woods. Tells him he looks like a peasant, and tells him he has a message to send to Kofi Kingston. Kofi cannot compete in the Royal Rumble match, but they found a replacement. And his name is Mustafa Ali. You know, you strip away this awful retribution gimmick. You've got a great character in Ali, and he has not been poisoned by retribution. I don't think he has the stain. Um, and hopefully these other members won't either when they repackage them and don't have these silly masks. But Ali is a great performer who has been saddled with just uh, the group of death. And I, I feel bad for all these people attached to this thing. It's it's high comedy. It's true. But, you know, the, the, the raw talent is there. They're giving him at least some time to speak and to be a part of the story. Uh, and uh, certainly the Kofi story is the thing that is keeping him afloat right now as somebody to be taken seriously amongst this group of, you know, pretty kind of laughable characters. Um, they're doing a good job, I think, you know, building to the Kofi thing. I, I love kind of the parallels of him replacing Kofi as part of the Rumble, like Kofi replaced him in uh, several other matches last, uh, two, however many years ago. Um, I think Woods, too, has been looking good in these singles matches. You know, unfortunately, he is kind of being positioned as sort of like little brother that gets beaten up before the big brothers come in for revenge. but it's for the purpose of a story. And I think they're doing a good job of telling it overall. I think Woods should eliminate Ali in the rumble. And then the next night on raw, it's payback. And they do a big angle with Xavier Woods. And that either leads to Kofi's return or a week or two later, it's pissed off Kofi coming for retribution. And you think Woods will eliminate him. I, th- I think you need to do something to get uh, get heat on Retribution to seek out their revenge and do a big injury angle with Woods. Uh, perhaps, yeah, perhaps. Like at least you're at least not winning this thing, so you might as well have somebody eliminate him that has a storyline purpose to it. Yeah. Riddle is with our truth. I thought this was this was crafted for you. These two um, finally, the, their worlds intersected in this this particular backstage segment. Yeah, I've been waiting for this. R-Truth called him the Riddler. And he's heard that the Hurt Business has a surprise party for him because his birthday was last week and understands they got him 24 gold carrots. But Riddle needs to keep it a secret. And Riddle says, I will. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know. They they're they they're they're two idiots bonding over how dumb they are. What would you rather happen during the Royal Rumble way? Would you like to be inundated with a three minute set of commercials or Bad Bunny performing live? I'll take Bad Bunny. I I might even have to pay to upgrade a tier to get Bad Bunny. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm. Um, you know, I, I I profess to not know much about Bad Bunny, but apparently he is a very popular artist. Got a big song about Booker T right now, 
and we're going to get a live performance at the show, which has been definitely the the first time during the pandemic we're getting any sort of celebrity per musical performance. Um, Essential personnel. Well, I, I suppose they need to do something to make this feel like it's a bigger show than usual. Do, <laughs> Bad do buddy. Think, do you think the set um will will look any different for this one? I think I think it will. Um, I think so too, with the big rain. I, I mean, and it's not like there's going to be people there, but I think they'll decorate it somewhat. Um, yeah, I think yeah, so. it's like it's it's you know I I think you can dress it up a little bit. Yeah, so I think so too. I mean, just, they are just in differentiate in a, it from your Raw and SmackDown. They are in a stadium, you know, where they can expand, and so I I would think that for a Rumble they would do something special. You don't want it to be like hollow, but it's you know. I'm sure they can have some ideas to just make it look a, a little bit different. And I mean, you'll still have all the virtual fans there for the countdowns and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. The VIP lounge, uh, the Hurt Business is in the ring. MVP calls Riddle a brain dead moron, but admits he is crafty. And Lashley says, sometimes you have to believe in someone else's belief in you. And it's only just begun for the Hurt Business. Benjamin is cut off by Alexander, who starts taking credit for all their recent success. And then Lashley takes back control, and they've gotten a gift for MVP. And it's a chain with the letters T-H-B on it for the Hurt Business. Benjamin and Alexander go back to arguing when our truth is out, and our truth thinks that the chain is the gift for him. T-H-B. Truth. Happy birthday. <laughs> Lashley says, you know what? I did get you a gift. It's right here in the ring. But before he can fall prey to them, he is jumped by the 24-7 guys. And we saw the return of Tucker. Oh, yeah. It's been a while. He's back. Couldn't get the pinfall, but he's back. He's part of like the, the leftover toy box here. Yes. He is uh, Tucker Everlasting. And then the Hurt Business attack. MVP's left alone. And then Riddle sneaks in from behind to attack the manager from behind, hits the final flash, and then runs for cover from the manager. Even the announcers were like, another hit and run. <laughs> you know, how would you cheer for this man? I, I thought it was a pretty weak segment, unfortunately, but that chain looks great. It looked very nice. Then they announced that later tonight we will hear from Edge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a surprise. Yeah, I was surprised that they just threw this was very nonchalant. They just threw this in. They didn't even announce this at the beginning of the show. This was like mm-hmm. halfway in that they just mentioned, hey. To me, that would have been the biggest hook of this show. I think if you had if you had put Goldberg out today too. Edge Edge gives us an update today. Um you know, I I think you that's the kind of surprise that People will speculate on what it's going to be, but then you're tuning in, and then you're rewarded with, oh, wow, my my hope is what they delivered to me. I, I totally would have put this out at least today. And uh, he's not in, in the arena, yeah, but that doesn't matter right now. No one would have complained about that. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. So anyway, Edge coming up later. Truth is hiding. He sees Adam Pierce. He wants to be in the Money in the Bank ladder match. Styles and Omos come in. They're going to give Truth an opportunity. Styles says that he is benevolent. Truth says, well, I'm a Capricorn. And then he asks almost if he's a Taurus. And I was waiting for someone to say, no, he was at the Impact tapings last week. Uh, he did have a joke about being in a Taurus with Road Dog once. That's right. Yes. They love Sheamus, Truth, man. This guy is like very consistent on everything. Listen, he's very, he's very funny. I am not going to take that away. He's an entertaining character. Um, this is just, he's in a sea of, I think, way too much comedy that does not land. And it's just a lot at times. But he himself, I have no issue with the man. He's a very funny character. Seamus and John Morrison. This was our 10-minute match. Morrison worked over Seamus' knee for 98% of this match. Seamus then gets up to his feet. White noise is blocked, but then he goes right back to the knee, chop blocking it. And Sheamus then forgets how to set up the cloverleaf. He literally has to reset the legs to go for this. Morrison's by the rope, but then catches him with a knee and hits the white noise. And Sheamus prevails with one knee. I thought it was actually a pretty good match. You know, maybe it's simply because it was like the only serious match on the show. But I felt like them taking a very slow technical approach was 
um, surprising to me because you have a, a high flyer here and then you have a brawler, and yet they kind of worked a really, you know, submission based match. I thought they did great. So then Miz challenges him to a handicap match, and Sheamus, of course, accepts. One of the most aggravating things tonight was that we had several spots throughout the different matches where people got thrown over the top rope. And like a wind-up doll, Tom Phillips had to, if this was the Royal Rumble, he'd be eliminated. This happened like three or four times tonight. It's their way of reminding you about the Rumble. Um... Literally, pre-Edge, what, what story is going into the Royal Rumble on the Raw? I'll give you both Raw and SmackDown. Like, beyond Daniel Bryan, what story are you following going into the Rumble before we got tonight's Edge announcement? Yeah, I'm trying to think who else there is of, of all the contenders. I can't even really name you who, like, the major contenders are. You know, these are That's a problem that, in and of itself. That, like, what are people fighting for? Why does somebody want to go to WrestleMania to become a champion? You know, whose story am I supposed to be latching on to right now? You know, you know who had the, the, did you see that Bianca Belair Chronicle? Not yet. No, I've heard. Amazing. It is unbelievably great. Um, I give her a lot of credit for being so open about her, her struggles with bulimia. And I only say that because I mean, it's, I really sometimes worry about these performers that share so much when there are vultures out there and the harassment that some of these people uh, subject themselves to. Uh, but I, I thought it was very commendable of her to just be so open about her struggles and uh, thoughts of suicide that she had. But it, it's a really, really tremendous chronicle that they put together. But at the end of it, it's it culminates in Bianca's appearance last year in the Rumble and getting all the eliminations. And then she just does like a two-minute promo about how this year I'm going into the Rumble. It's not about getting a record for eliminations because I did that. It's not about lasting a certain amount of time. I did that last year. It's only about winning. If I don't win, then I failed. And it was just like this great, you got this whole backstory of 25 minutes where it would be impossible for you not to be rooting for this woman just in any, anything that she puts her efforts towards. And then at the end, it's just like her promo for the rumble of, why this task is so important for her and taking her career to the next level. It's like, this was amazing. Yeah. I mean, every single one of these chronicles, I think ends with us feeling like they should have put this on the TV show. Cause it does a better job of selling you the personality behind it, the struggle behind the person than any of these storylines that they're trying to manufacture because oftentimes they feel incredibly authentic. Um, well, I will check it out. So thank you for that note. It's, it's very good. So the handicap match, uh, Morrison did this tope to the floor. They're double teaming Sheamus. Sheamus battles back with a rolling senton to Miz on top of Morrison. Then he climbs to the top turnbuckle and hits a double clothesline to the floor. The man selling his knee. Morrison then grabs the leg to stop a brogue kick. Morrison misses coming off the rope. He eats the brogue kick, but with Sheamus' back turned, he is hit with the skull-crushing finale, and Miz pins Sheamus in 650. I'm, I mean, I'm guessing they needed to, again, fill time for this. And I suppose because of Miz holding the money in the bank, you wanted to make him look strong. But by the end of this, I just, I, I'm not, I'm not sure, um, you know, cause you book Seamus over Morrison to make Seamus look good. And then you have him stupidly agree to a handicap match for no reason, or he is beaten up for like 10 minutes and then he loses. So I I, I guess I was a little confused by it all. Yeah, Seamus, she- I mean, it really feels like he just had the rug pulled out from underneath him because he just got lost uh, in the aftermath of Goldberg's return. You don't think they'll go back to it at some point? I mean, you could. It just it feels like they lost all momentum because they're not even, like, referencing. Like, they're not even doing, like, the buddy segments with him and Drew anymore. Like, wouldn't... like. Just well, just do a backstage segment together to kind of keep that in your in your periphery. Yeah, well, Drew has been away for two weeks, but you know, it it's certainly not um, the focus of the character. Yeah, no there Keith Lee no on the show either tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, Ric Flair is then in the in the locker room with Lacey Evans in their dressing room, and he's uh, they just redid the. This was like the PG version of the Trish Stratus 
Triple H segment from 20 yes. years ago. Yes. And Charlotte walks in as Rick is behind her, teaching her how to escape a hold. And Charlotte tells Lacey to get lost. And Rick comes up to Charlotte and says, I've got a place here, even though you're a big star now. Charlotte says, you spent money on everyone except your family. I'm the only one protecting you now. You're going from legend to old man. I'm not the bad guy here. And she said that so many times. I think that was meant literally that you're supposed to cheer me in this segment, even though I'm completely (laughs) degrading and humiliating my father uh, for having this relationship that might, might I add that it's in, in WWE Canon, like Ric Flair is not married. Is he? I don't know if that's ever been mentioned. Um, Does it need to be? Like, it's not mentioned. It's not brought up. It's not part of this story. It's if you're just watching this, it's like, here's the Ric Flair, the playboy. That's what's what's so wrong here. Well, what's wrong is that he is um, turning on his daughter and in fact, letting her letting his daughter get attacked in front of him and really not doing much like that's pretty wrong. Well, she's been very difficult. I mean, it's uh. In Lacey no... comes back. Yeah, sorry. Please finish this. Lacey comes back and blasts her with the woman's right from behind, and Rick Rick just watches as Lacey drills her into her head into the, like the wall, and then Rick like just looks over top of her and leaves with Lacey. It's, it's just this story is awful. It's, it's terrible. Like, I can appreciate the fact that maybe like they screwed up in that first instance, and Rick wasn't supposed to look like he was this kind of heartless. But after, like, kind of going into it several weeks now, it's like, this is making Rick look so irredeemable as a human being that I just, it's Could could this not turn out to be that Charlotte and Rick are are playing Lacey? And this is Charlotte's reference a few weeks ago to learning from the dirtiest player in the game. And that is how you, that's where you end up. And then Charlotte's a heel at the end of this. Yeah, absolutely. It, it it can be. I just hate, hate, hate stories that make you, that assume so much. Like, how did they know Lacey Evans was going to be outside this door and that she would come in here and, and, and attack? Like, they had this whole conversation between the two of them. What? Like, without, like, knowing oh, that this plan is listening? If this has turned out to be a plan, Rick has cost her matches. Rick has led her to getting a concussion from this... Uh, shot to the back of the head that we just saw here, and then her head is drilled into the wall. It's a stupid plan if that's the end of this whole thing. Not to mention Lacey comes off like a fool by the end of it, but yeah. anyway, I don't know. This storyline's gone nowhere for me. It's I think it's hurt Charlotte because it's so confusing. I feel like she's in three different storylines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the tag titles really are, are not a factor at all, unless it's Friday, I, I suppose. R-Truth and AJ Styles, the uh, meeting here of these two. They note that AJ has been 12-2 and two since he was drafted to Raw. So someone's keeping track. Uh, Truth surprises him and tosses him over the top rope. If this was the Royal Rumble, AJ Styles would be eliminated. Truth gets knocked down and then he looks up and there is almost staring him down. He hits the five-knuckle shuffle. After slamming him down, and then Truth goes for the AA that's countered to the calf crusher, and AJ wins in 234. It's fine. 13 and 2. That's that's huge. Yeah. Fine, inoffensive match. Then we had Alexa in her playground backstage reacting to Randy's uh, Lucha Libre mask uh, promo last week, where... Alexa is talking to the imaginary fiend and she said she just wanted to have fun with Oscar in her playground, but Oscar didn't want to play nice, but neither did I tonight. She's going to win a shiny new toy. And I don't feel like playing nice tonight either. And we went in close on her face as Bray overtook her voice again saying, let me in. I thought this segment was painful. It was so slow. The acting is so cringeworthy. You know, like this is a somehow it's like we often complain about the camera cuts being so fast. I felt like this was the opposite where the cameras, everything was just so slow. 
you knew where it was all going. I just in and, and the I just wish I could have skipped it. Well, there was more to come with our magic tricks. Matt Riddle running the gauntlet. He took on Shelton Benjamin first, and they're going at a pretty fast pace. Uh, Riddle went for a triangle and got slammed out, and then does the O'Connor roll. Cedric Alexander distracts the referee as Shelton counters the O'Connor roll, and he's got the visual, but Cedric and his distraction allows Riddle to get out. This was verbatim what they did with Ruby reversing the uh, the O'Connor roll on Asuka and Billy Kay distracting the referee on Friday. Identical. Well, it's the same people booking all this stuff. Well, then that's that should be a reason not to be doing it three days later. Yeah. They only have we so just did finishes. this on Friday. Yeah. So Riddle reverses and he pins Shelton. Benjamin and Alexander continue to argue. MVP then rolls into the ring and is caught in a heel hook and submits in 10 seconds. Yep. Matt Riddle versus Cedric Alexander. Uh, They had a fine match here. Uh, Alexander was in control for a lot of it, but MVP is getting more and more irritated at Cedric Alexander not winning the match. The guy who lost in 10 seconds is upset that this guy can't get the win. They just want to get out of here because if Riddle wins, he gets another U.S. title match. Uh, There's a PK that misses, a Broton onto Alexander's knees, And then Alexander hit a brain buster. Real kicks out of that. MVP is getting more upset. Cedric then comes off the top, misses. Riddle rolls to a triangle, power bombed out, reapplies it. And then Riddle holds onto the wrists and cradles Alexander in 703. So Riddle wins and he gets his title shot against Bobby Lashley. Yeah, isn't it like the third time? It's at least the second. I thought the match was good. You know, athleticism on full display from both men. Um, story is dull, but in a vacuum, I thought this portion of the match was enjoyable. They did not, uh, they did not announce this for the rumble, but I would assume that that's where this takes place. The the show doesn't really need it though, does it? They've got the two rumble matches. Um, you've got a very short each. Yep. Probably an hour each there. Drew and Goldberg will be short. Reigns and Owens will be long. And then you've got the uh, the women's tag title match. So I, I guess you have five matches. That's a full card already. Well, something's going to go on the kickoff as well, Way, so don't forget about that. Yeah. Well, maybe this one. I mean, um, I think it'll probably be a Raw thing. Then they announced the, uh, the Peacock News, and we go to Edge in the empty ring on his property. He says how you can't sleep on tomorrow. That's what 2020 has taught us. You have to reach and fight for it every day and keep walking forward. Always forward. And he left WrestleMania 27 10 years ago as champion. But then within a week, he had to forfeit his title and his career. And he remembers the words his mom told him when he said he was going to be a wrestler to just go do it. And those words were the fuel to get his career back after nine years away. And then Randy Orton tore his triceps at Backlash, and it was all gone again. And he could just hear his mom saying, just go do it. And that's what he's going to do. He is entering the Royal Rumble. He knows the window is closing. He needs to win the Rumble, go to WrestleMania, and take what is his, what he never lost. And he will fight with everything he has. A world without dreamers and fighters is a less magical place. And then quotes Henry Ford, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And I think I can. Can we just like have everybody just sit down and go into a dark room and talk into a camera for an hour and we'll take the best five minutes because this was great. I don't know how two men could go so far off course from one another than Edge coming back with this promo and... (laughs) goofball closing raw tonight with fucking like a bonfire going off on his face. They could not be further apart thematically on this show. Well, he he doesn't have to work with the fiend. That's a big difference. Really great promo from edge. You know, I love this kind of nice, quiet, intimate setting. And I'm reminded that like, you know, when this whole pandemic started, it was him and Orton that continue to have these great segments, despite the lack of audience. 
And this was no different. You know, he, it, it really helps his style of promo to not have that audience there. Didn't shout his words. He spoke like a determined human being, only raising his voice to emphasize aggression at the right moment. It was a really high quality promo, I thought. I really like that they did it this way rather than the easy like surprise on Sunday. To me, it's like you got your surprise last year. It's like mm-hmm. to me, this was the way to go about things. I liked it so much better. It's automatically the most interesting story of any of the Rumble matches on Sunday. And I think you have uh, like, yes, you know that they'll get back to him and Orton at some point. But I think like there's like we don't know what the plan is for Drew, but like Edge going for the title he never lost against Drew is as good an option as they've got for Drew. I'm sure he would love that that direction. I think it's it's a, at the very least it's a believable outcome you can see them going with. Yeah. Yeah, it's possible. And then we have the final segment. Oscar and Alexa Bliss. Uh they are they may have sealed worst feud of the year, but we're only a couple weeks in. Asuka goes for a hip attack and misses and lands on the floor. Suddenly, we hear this music. A rocking horse has just magically appeared in the ring, and Alexa is riding this rocking horse. That is the setup for the commercial break. We come back. Match is just like nothing had happened. We are right back into wrestling holds. Well, listen, um, crazier things have happened. You know, you No, this was pretty crazy. This was pretty crazy. Well, we saw a man get burned alive. We saw multiple people get burned. We saw an eye come out. Rocking horse is just kind of whatever. Yeah. This um we may have seen Randy Orton uh, burned alive. Uh we were watching Oscar figuratively go up in flames uh in these back-to-back matches with Alexa. She hits a German and a kick to the face, and then Alexa's old music starts playing, and she morphs into the goddess version, meaning a wardrobe change way. Mm-hmm. She's also crying. Asuka is looking concerned, but then runs at her and misses. The lights go out, and Alexa changes back into the demon version of Alexa. Hot topic, Bliss. And Asuka, God, she is literally watching a ghost as Alexa goes killer Kota. And Asuka tries to attack her this time, but Alexa either avoids the strikes or no-sells it. Asuka then goes for the Asuka lock, but Bliss powers out of it and puts on the mandible claw. When Randy Orton (laughs) appears... Minus his mask, so he's got burns all over his face, and he hits Alexa with an RKO to end this show. I had no words at the end of this. This is, I will just say this, Randy Orton must be the most trust trusting individual that he will literally do anything you put in front of him. This is clear evidence that you throw any idea at Randy Orton 2021 version. Done. I'll do it. Night vision goggles, burning a guy, being burnt yourself. This was, uh, you know, pretty awful. Um, I think the clothes changing gimmick was maybe, I don't even think it was cute the first time. Um, but basing a whole match around that concept, I I just really find it difficult to be convinced that Alexa is any sort of like possessed demonic version of herself when her look is not all that intimidating, intimidating. I think the wrestling looks fake. I felt the match was really hard to get into because I knew the shenanigans were coming anyway. Um, I think it's just a really bad story and a bad kind of usage of like, I don't know, like high school level camera effects for somebody as important as Asuka in your title picture. Like, you you would think at the Rumble, providing, like, Randy is in it, they don't do some angle with with the Fiend or something. Like, he's got to have at least a face-to-face with Edge. And I don't, like, how can these burns disappear by Sunday 
in in story. Like, you know how goofy that's going to look? I, I, I want to see it more than anything. I think Burns heal differently in the WWE. I mean, we saw <laughs> Kane, after 30 years, still have soot on his face. That's true. He also, burn. yeah, and had half his hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, wounds just heal differently. I, I don't know what a burn after two weeks looks like, but I don't think it looks like... Like you smashed a jelly sandwich in your face. Well, you know what? In, instead of putting like the little uh, the little credits in the uh, the bottom corner, instead they should have just faded to black, and Vince McMahon should have like turned around in his swivel chair and just said, two hundred million dollars annually." It's <laughs> really all there is, honestly. Like we can complain about the show. Like this show was. I thought pretty awful. Like, I think raw storytelling at the moment is just so low right now. Every story is weak. And but by raw standards, listen, we, I, I took this, like I got that opening drew segment and the edge promo. And if I get, I get, if I get 10 minutes out of raw, I'm good. I'm good. Oh well, yeah. Well, unfortunately we got a lot more than the 10 minutes. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. I'm, some point it will matter, but to, this week it does. It does not. The Doesn't show matter is, right now. No, no, that was it. As in terms of Royal Rumble, uh, you know they've they've got one more episode on Friday. But wh- where would you categorize legitimate interest in Royal Rumble versus leaning on the history of this event? That it's the Royal Rumble and that props up your interest. Like if you were a new viewer of WWE in the last year, what what is the intrigue for a Royal Rumble? I, I think certainly Edge is significant. It's significant, but I don't think he's really got a chance. I he does have a chance, absolutely. I suppose like he's been he hasn't really been back long enough for me to be attached to the story. I I at, personally, at the very least, it's a big angle. Like whoever eliminates him, like that's that's a big story. It's it's someone of significance in this rumble, which this this rumble is pretty much lacking in. Like we've got Edge and Brian. And beyond that, like it would have to be some wild surprise of like the people you would honestly look as people you're looking at to win this thing. Yeah, for me, in terms of emotional attachment, I don't really have it for really any characters except Daniel Bryan personally. Um, I so I can't really say like beyond the concept of the Rumble it, it itself that I'm all that interested in the show. I do think Drew and Goldberg will be, you know, that's a first time thing. We'll see how they book it and we'll see how they protect Goldberg. And we'll see how exciting they can make it because I think that certainly has like a you know potential to be uh, one of like Drew's biggest moments. Yeah, I think you have to be clever in how you put that match together because I think less is more, and that's you can't expect much more than I would say. Like, what does that match top out at? Ten minutes? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go on over to the forum and tonight's show. Have you looked yet? I just looked. A 3.88 out of 10. Why don't you start things off? We got a Paul from New Jersey who says, Every time the Miz and Morrison yell correct, not only does an angel not receive its wings, but an angel has its wings violently removed. What was with that woman segment having two restarts? Could we not have pinned Dana in one match? On a positive note, I, I really like the promo work of both McIntyre and Ali as of late. My DVR was malfunctioning and I couldn't watch the rest of the show. I think it's trying to protect me. Andrew from Cape Breton. He has his disdain here for The Fiend. It's the worst wrestling gimmick WWE has ever done. Worse than Mantar. Worse than Repo Man. Worse than anything they've done for a wrestling character. One issue tonight, like with last week, was the match with The Fiend, Alexa Bliss, which is pointless. All offense is pointless because you know the match is going to go to the goofiness and there's no progression. For some more negativity, Nia Jax should not be wrestling anymore. Not just for the Dana Brooke spot, but she's also a lot slower and lumbering. Raw is also a two-hour show spread across three, and it was apparent with how some of the matches were extended. The positives were some good wrestling with Riddle, The Hurt Business, Sheamus, and John Morrison. They have the talent. I'm baffled people work hard on producing this show. Two out of ten. Uh, we have Matt and Abbott asking about why Randy Orton was allowed to RKO Alexa Bliss on USA when... Uh, what is it? Uh, Reginald couldn't hit Sasha on SmackDown. Is it? Uh, do you do you have any idea about that? Is it simply because one's cable, one's network? No, no. It's like that. That's WWE's own 
edict. Like they could, they could do that if they wanted to. It's just something they've opted not to. I mean, what, when they did it, um, you know, I mean, that's like they did it a few years ago with, with Orton, with, with Nia Jax. It's not like they haven't done any of it before. It's just like, that's, that's WWE's decision of like whether they do it or not. I don't think they're going to get any backlash for doing it. I don't think so either. I mean, it's a wrestling move, you know? Uh, next up is Aaron from Brampton. Uh, or is that the one you just read? No, I read the one okay, it's, above. Oh, I guess okay, I have the same question. Pretty much the same question here. Uh, now that WWE has another big deal with NBC, do you guys think they'd be open to making Raw two hours? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, they're, they're locked into a contract for another uh, four years at three hours. And they have international deals now that call for the three hours. So I, I don't see them consolidating the, the length of Raw. Raw, I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't see what one has to do with the other. No, I mean, Raw is three hours. Separate so deals. That, so that they can have uh, ratings for the three hours on a Monday. Um, I, if your suggestion is that, well, now that they've got all this content to shove in front of our faces, maybe they'll let up on us on a Monday. That's not happening. I think if anything, you'll see more, more hours added to, you know, something like NXT first before you see a reduction. Like if there's one thing that I think this week has proven, it's that the more content you make, the more content you could sell. Yeah, that's, that's the key. Um, I think another interesting thing is that currently it's, a 30 day window before WWE network could add the latest episodes of raw and SmackDown. And at least for raw, like you do have like the Hulu version that goes up the next day, but that's a edited down version. I would wonder if NBC is now incentivized that they could put up raw onto Peacock much, much quicker than 30 days. If they have that deal. Yeah, sure. If they have the ability Let's go to Kate, who says, if I were WWE and knew what had been happening with Raw, Raw's ratings late, lately, I think I would have announced in advance that Edge was making an appearance. As it stands, I feel like his announcement is the only thing that happened over the last three hours that might have gotten people more excited about the seeing the Rumble on Sunday. The show just seems sloppy, both in concept and execution. Alexander from Portland. Tonight was garbage. Why book Charlotte and Shayna one-on-one if the end result is a multi-woman tag? Why book Riddle beating both tag champions to get a shot at the U.S. champion? Why does Randy Orton need to be booked to interfere in an Oscar title defense? Goldberg has no appeal to me whatsoever. The show has no appeal to me whatsoever. Two out of ten. I'm amazed I got a two based on that feedback. WWE advertised Edge for the Royal Rumble. Do you think he should have been kept as a surprise entrant instead? No. I don't. I, li- I really liked what they did tonight with him doing the promo going into it. I agree with you. Finally, we got a Nick who says, I actually really enjoyed the opening to tonight's show. Jordan Goldberg's, Goldberg's confrontation didn't feel overcomplicated. The segment felt intense and went a long way in selling the match to me. The rest of tonight felt like a banner episode for why Raw should be two hours. Filler segments, video recaps, match restarts, fault, non-finishes. And at the end of it all, it's genuinely hard to tell who has any momentum going into Sunday. I enjoyed Riddle getting to play the crafty babyface for the night. However, I doubt he needed to make the whole Hurt business look foolish in the process. Alexa's character work was immense once again, but seeing Randy appear looking like sloth from the Goonies really took me out of the moment. Overall, another night that feels like a missed opportunity. WWE needing to announce the first, second, and 30th Rumble participants on backstage really diminishes the effect of the match. Same with Edge declaring via a pre-tape promo. Vince, we're going to watch the Rumble. No need to spoil things ahead of time. It's almost like they're not confident in the way they built things up week to week. Well, that's to get you to watch backstage. Yeah, I mean, like I, I don't see any harm in, you know, putting out like some news the night before to get people excited for the rumble the next day. And the same with edge, like that's, that's just promoting your event. I mean, it to me makes much more sense. Like think about you're never going to replicate and it's impossible, especially this year to replicate what you did last year with edge. So why do such a watered down version with the virtual fans doing like some fake reaction um, as opposed to that promo we got tonight that gives you a whole week of, Advertising Edge as like one of the yeah, one one of the key uh, selling features of the Rumble. So I I didn't see any issue with with any of those, including you know put out put out that stuff on backstage. Why not? Yeah. With that said, uh, last thing before we go, did you end up watching any of the UFC card on Saturday? I did see the main event. Yes. Um, I thought Connor looked pretty good. 
until he won the first round. Yep, yep. Until I guess the leg kicks and then just uh, getting beaten up. But you know, it was uh, for me. It was most interesting to see perhaps his demeanor throughout the entire thing. He just seemed incredibly. He seemed kind of different. He seemed um, happy. His um, his side is seems to be really pushing for, like right after Connor was talking about wanting to do the trilogy with Nate Diaz uh, today. His coach uh, John Cavanaugh was uh, talking to Ariel Hawani. And he was pushing the idea of going right to the third fight with Dustin Poirier with the title on the line. And I know a lot of people will groan at that going right back to the same fight. Uh, I do not throw that out. I, I don't throw any Connor possibilities uh, out the window. Um, he is going to have still a lot of currency, uh, whatever his next fight is going to be. But I mean, where, who would you like to see Connor fight next? Is there something that, that jumps out at you? And do you think that Nate Diaz, Dustin Poirier are two of those options? Uh, yeah, but I don't really know what characters are on the table right now. Um, I don't know if we're even strictly talking about MMA at this point. You know, it could be people in other fields. It could be, you know, stars from the past. I I don't really have much of an answer to give you, unfortunately, John. I'm just kind of a casual observer at this point. Uh, just kind of, you know, absorbing some of the hysteria that's attached to this guy. But I definitely found myself even far less interested in this one than previous. Well, um Sports Business Journal just put out a thing tonight where uh, John Oran reported uh, 1.2 million buys on ESPN Plus, and he also is reporting another 400,000 buys internationally, which sounds like an enormous number uh, if that's the international number of buys. Uh, if this and one how is. does that compare to other previous uh, Connor fights and also the, the recent Khabib fight? Uh, this would be, well, the Khabib fight back in October did 500,000. So this dwarfed that. Um, the last Connor fight a year ago with Donald Cerrone did 1.3. So this would be higher than that, which I'm not surprised by. ESPN Plus is, is uh, that much uh, much larger than it was a year ago. And I thought this fight had more more buzz behind it than than the Cerrone fight. So that was actually, in like, I, I was thinking like 1.5, 1.6 for this one. So if it comes in, uh, around that range. It does not uh, surprise me. And, you know, a figure like that, it's, you know, the Khabib fight is gone at this point, that if you are the UFC, it's what is, what's our next biggest fight that we can make. And if you're looking at this as a pure, uh, just who deserves the title, uh, Dustin Poirier versus Charles Oliveira, or even Dustin Poirier versus Michael Chandler, it's not doing the business that a rematch between Poirier and Conor McGregor will do. And if you wait six months and, and do that, it's, I think it'll still be big. There is, there is still going to be a lot of interest in Conor. And I am definitely not one that looked at that performance on Saturday and am writing him off. There were some concerning parts of that fight. It's the first time we've seen him uh, knock, knocked out, but um, I, I'm still not at the point where I'm looking like this is the official decline of Conor McGregor. I, I think that we'll learn quite a lot in this next fight, whoever he ends up fighting next. And the streamer got away. Oh, dude, uh, the streamer got away and it looked as if uh, ESPN plus nearly got away. It was insanity on Saturday night with ESPN plus subscribers where, yeah, that was, that was the comedy of the night was Dana saying they were going to nail this streamer who apparently Dana said the streamer, put out a statement and plugged where you can legally buy the pay-per-view. And Dana said that was a really good move by him, but every pay-per-view we're going to pick one of these people and we're going to go after them. So Dana's going to take down online piracy this year. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's long-term booking. It's, 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 it's to me as much of a draw as any fight. This is the real fight. It's Dana versus which pirate, uh, piracy streamer, I suppose, uh, He's going to go after every single week. I'm still waiting for some results here. Yeah. Could you have imagined 20 years ago, like Vince McMahon, remember when he did all those maniacal promos before the NWO came in? Imagine him doing those promos on like uh, illegal streamers. We're watching your house. Are, are you I'm surprised listening. that like WWE hasn't made a big, bigger effort in, in combating piracy? Um, I mean, publicly that they, they haven't, but it's also like, they're not, they're also not in the pay-per-view industry where I, I, I don't know, really, like, honestly, it's a subject that I'm not all that well versed on about like, 
I I think like their their thing is like they had a point where like it was not hard. Like if you had a WWE network login that so many people could log in on, on one thing. And I don't think it was something they were actively policing all that hard. Now I do think they clamped down on it at a certain point, but I, I, I think it's like just a different kind of set of circumstances where one is a $70 pay-per-view and the other it's God, they're basically giving the network away for free. As long as you sign up with an email address. Like yeah. they, they make it like if you want to watch a WWE show for free, they make it extremely easy for you and they encourage it. And maybe even easier now. It's very easy now. Like there is not the the level of uh barriers to to watch a WWE to watch WrestleMania. Like if if you want to spend five dollars or um that's another point of this. Like I would imagine like the the free promotion. It'll be interesting if they ever kind of revisit that. If Peacock sees that as a strategy t- down the road to bring so people in for a for a small window. Peacock does have a f- oh, you mean like a free month type of thing? Yeah, that kind of they, thing. They have like free month trials. I think attached to certain things that you can you know subscribe to, like all su- subscription services have. But um, you know they do also have that free tier Peacock themselves that's ad supported, and so I wonder what WWE content might be you know, put towards that one, you would mm-hmm. figure maybe the stuff that's on their free tier right now on the network, they would just transition to, to the Peacock. Yeah. And then in 2022, they're going to start with an annual documentary release on Peacock. Uh, on what is that? that. What, what's, what's different between that and what they do every month? I, the fact that they isolated that as like a specific release, that's going to start an annual release. That to me tells me it's going to be like a bigger project, like a last ride or something like that. You would think. Yeah, I would think so too. Maybe with, with some NBC involvement, um, but sure. We shall see. Yeah. I mean, the big ones off the table though, because they're already developing the Vince one for Netflix. Like mm-hmm. that would be the subject you would want. Number one, but I, I'm sure they will not have uh, a shortage of ideas. All right. Uh, It's been a lengthy show, but we covered a lot of ground, Uh, a lot coming up this week. We are back on Tuesday. We've got uh, Rocky Five review coming your way. Have you started? I have. I finished it, actually. Okay. Well, we are going to be revisiting Rocky. We're moving up to 1990. And Mm -hmm. man, it's going to be a struggle as Rocky enters a new new decade. Uh, We will be reviewing that for all CAFE members. uh, So check back on uh, Tuesday would you say Tuesday afternoon, early evening? Yeah, sometime. I would say maybe Tuesday, early evening. Watch for that show. And we've also got a bunch of stuff on the website as well. We're going to have Deep Impact with Davey Portman reviewing tonight's, uh, or yeah, tonight's Impact. And then we're going to have Shot in the Dark on Wednesday, Wednesday at noon. Wednesday, yes. And then we're back live Wednesday night for our Double Double Ice Cap and Espresso patrons with Rewind to Dynamite Wednesday night at 10.15 Eastern Time. So we will speak with you then. Join the Royal Rumble pool. It's open till Sunday at 3 Eastern. And that's it. As Wei Ting always says. See ya. I never say that.